Talk Radio. Mi chiamo Apura Kanu Apurai Kaitnut. Ne ye ojira da. Me dinde ojira po. Poisi ra nehmpta akan. Akwamumain amaruka etibi mu ojira po. That means greetings to all Apura Kani Apurai Kaitnut. People, meaning Africans, black people today, is Ojira Day, Purification Day. My name is Ojirafo Kwesi Ra Nehem Pata Akan, Ojirafo of the Apamu Nation in North America. Yet I say we thank you for tuning in to the show once again. We are going to place some links in the chat room dealing with the information we will be addressing tonight. For individuals who are uh, new to the broadcast, we have three broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akan Fo Nana Som, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion, on Joda on Monday night. And we deal specifically with the Akan expression of ancestral religion, first and foremost, because we are an Akan group, but secondly, because of the misinformation promulgated by individuals in the Western Hemisphere as well as from the continent on Akan culture, cosmology, ancestral religion, spirituality, and so forth, because of the infection of Christianity, Islam, white culture in general on the continent, some of our people have incorporated those infections into the fabric of the culture and their presentation of Akan tradition, religion, spirituality, culture, and so forth has been infected and manifested these infections. So we clarify concepts, clarify cosmology, clarify and recognize and understand the nature of the Great Mother and the Great Father, Inyamewa, and Inyame, the nature of the Yabosom, the deity, the nature of the Nananong, Nsamanfo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors and their relationship to us, the nature of our Kra, our Krawa, our soul, divine consciousness, as a personal obosom dwelling in the head region of Apurakani, Apurakani people only. So we deal with these concepts, many other different concepts, dealing with Akanfo Nanasom, ancient authentic Akan ancestral religion. On Awukuda or Akuada Wednesday night, we have Egua Marketplace Day. On that show, we uh, showcase Apurakani, Apurakani businesses organizations, and institutions who are serving the Apurakani, Apurakani community in a positive capacity, also maintain our ancestral religious values in the context of that service to the community. So we have had a number of individuals come on, talk about their businesses, organizations, and institutions, the truth to behind their development of these entities, how their ancestral religious values inform their service to the community, and in that process, we have also published the Okom Economic Development Model. It is an economic development model rooted in our ancestral religious value. It is an approach to economic development rooted in our culture. So we published that document. When you go to our Okom page, and we will put that link in the chat room right now, the Okom page on our website, on ojirofolk.com, you can download the Okom Economic Development Model. You can also download the four-part series that we did on Blog Talk, and we saved them as videos on YouTube, and you can access them from that page as well, dissecting that model, explicating that model, showing how it impacts every aspect of our lives as Akurakani, Akurakani people, African people, black people. We also have the broadcast, Ekuakuti, Economic Warfare, and we also have Nukwari Fone, Amamre, Employment, and Ancestral Culture. So you can download those broadcast from that page, as well as the Okong Economic Development Model. We also have the list of businesses, organizations, and institutions that have come onto the show and spent two hours with us. It's a growing list because those businesses, organizations, and institutions, and those coming up are part of our Okong Economic Development Model operation. In the process of the Okong Economic Development Model, we have the method of starve the beast to feed and feed the prize. And what that means is we make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds we would have potentially wasted with the whites and their offspring 
and then we starve the beast and feed the pride. We reallocate those funds away from those white businesses and direct them towards the business organization or institution of the week. We are targeting one Akurakani, Akurakani business organization or institution per week for 52 weeks. Started in February, and we are um, in the midst of that process. We've gone, it's been over six months, but we're in the midst of that process. When you look on the Okong Economic Development page, you'll see the list of businesses who have already come onto the show that we have uh, supported as a community since February. Now, we target one business organization or institution per week for uh, optimal capital infusion. So that means when you starve the beast and feed the pride, when you take the $10 you would have wasted at a white business, at a white grocery store, at a white uh, convenience store, a white restaurant, and you take that $10 and reallocate it, starve the beast and feed the pride directed to the business organization or institution of the week, whether you make a donation or you access their products and or services, then that's a transfer of economic activity. If a thousand of our people do that in the course of a week, that's a transfer of $10,000 of capital from white businesses directly back into the hands of the black community. And that business organization or institution receiving that infusion of capital will thus be able to expand their business expand their product line and their services to us, hire within our community so that those new employees can have employment and serve us at a greater capacity at the same time. It is a win-win situation, of course. If we do not engage in this process, then by default, we are leaving that $10,000 plus in the hands of our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring, the Achiwadiefo, the spirits of disorder. White Americans, white Europeans, white Hindus, white Arabs, white Hispanics, white Latinos, white pseudo-Native Americans, white Asians, and so forth, all non-Apurakani, non-Apurakani people are the whites and their offspring spirits of disorder, incarnating as spirits of disorder, without exception. So when we, by default, support our enemies, we are financing our own oppression. So we only have one choice the choice to reallocate, to starve the white beast, starve the beast and feed the product. So we deal with that on Egua Marketplace Day. We also, this particular week, is our final week of broadcasting for this period of our year. Our year begins on September 22nd or September 23rd, depending upon the year. The first full day of the Atem Atemet Equinox, the so-called Autumn Equinox, is our New Year's Day in Aquamu Mine, Amarukai Tifi Mudi, Aquamu Nation in North America. We have a seven-day um, ancestral New Year celebration called Obrajira Nananom Som. It is a form of the Ojira celebration. Many Akanfo, Akan people in Apuraka, Apurakai celebrate the New Year as Ojira purification a seven-day celebration in many areas. We also observe Ojira, which we call Obrajira, Mananom Song. We celebrate our new year for seven days. Our, day, our seven days observance this year is from September 17th to September 23rd. And on September 23rd, that is our New Year's Day. That is the first day of 13,016, about 12 weeks, 13 weeks prior to the beginning of the pseudo new year of January 1st that the whites and their offspring observe in the dead of winter, the darkness of midnight, the coldest time of the year. Only cave dwelling, ice cave dwelling Europeans would wait until the darkest time of the year, the coldest time of the year, the shortest day of the year, and come out and yell out, Happy New Year. That's insane. We deal with a natural cycle. When the sun is setting, that is akin to the autumn equinox, the end of the cool part or the warm part of the year, the beginning of the seeding part of the year, the harvest time, but also the seeding time. The ends of the year meet at that particular time. So this is why we observe the New Year celebration at that time. So this week, 
including tomorrow, is the last day of our broadcasting for this year, 13,015. And we will go from September 17th through the 23rd, our seven-day New Year observance. And we won't have any broadcast during that seven-day period. And then we will be back on on uh, September 28th. And that will be, for us, September 28th, 13,016. That will be the first broadcast of our new year. So, um, and we're going to talk about some more of that information at the end of the show. So, on Tuesday night, Spinada, Abinada, which is tonight, of course, we have Ojida, purification. The term Ojida means purification. It also means a celebration of purification. Of course, in the Akan language, and we just talked about that celebration of purification, which is our New Year celebration. In the language of ancient Kanat and Kemet, so-called Nubia and Egypt, the term Jida is written in the Medutu, the hieroglyphs. Jida means purification. It also means a celebration of purification. Of course, it is the exact same term with the exact same meanings because our language as Akan people, just as many other Akuraikani people around the continent, is directly derived from that ancient ancestral language. It is the same language. So we speak the same words with the same definitions. We worship the same deities by the same name, unchanged for thousands of years up to this very moment. So when we talk about Jida purification, we're talking about purifying knowledge of the cults, purifying cosmology, purifying knowledge of ritual practice purifying concepts so we can incorporate these things into our lives in a harmonious fashion. We always say that Ojira purification operationalizes nanasom. Nanasom is a term for Afurakani, Afuraikani, or African ancestral religion. Afurakani, Afuraikani, ancestral religion, in essence, is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual, we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and therefore restore balance to our lives. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. The expansive and contractive poles of Nanasom, of Afurakani, Afuraikani, ancestral religion. Ojira purifies and operationalizes Nanasom. Purification, Ojira, purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring balance to our lives. And in this manner, we can regulate every thought, every intention, every action, every moment of every day so that we can align ourselves and or realign ourselves with divine order every moment of every day. This is our culture and our ritual practice. This is what ancestral religion is, no matter what expression it takes. The ancient ancestral expression of Kanat, Nubian Kemet, and as we migrated from those regions, we carried that same ancestral religious practice, the alignment with the great mother and great father supreme being through the agency of the deities and ancestral spirits, ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring balance every moment of every day. We carried that same practice everywhere we migrated in the world. All over the continent, we have different dialects of our ancestral primordial language, and we have different motifs and different expressions and so forth, but the fundamental basis of our culture is the same. Even when we were forced into the Western Hemisphere during the Musuo Kesi, the great perversity, the enslavement era, we continued to bring our ancestral religious practices with us to North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe. And those who maintained their ancestral religious practice, those who maintained Nanason, are those who wage war against the whites and their offspring who are motivated and guided by the Abosom, the deities, by the Nananom, Unsamapo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors who were motivated, guided, and empowered to wage war against the white slavers effectively. 
and we began to massacre the white slavers effectively. It was because of our incessant warfare that we brought an end to the slave system in North America, in Central South America, the Caribbean, as well as Europe. So we deal with that in one of our broadcasts, Nana Son and the Defeat of Slavery. We correct that record. So this is what we're dealing with on Ojida, purification. And tonight, subject Hetep, self-sacrifice as ritual offering, implication for warfare. So we're going to talk about what Hetep actually is and its implications that are often not examined, but are actually a part and parcel integral components of our ancestral religious practice. We're talking about self-sacrifice. So we're going to go to our Achedie page, and we define the term hetep, the term hetep in ancient Kemet, but it also means offering. Hetep in ancient Kemet is vocalized in the Akan languages, Achede. So Chede, it comes from Hetep in, in ancient Kemet, Kanit in Kemet, Chede in Akan, or Achede in Akan. In the Asante dialect, Achede, in the Akwamu and Equiapem dialect, a, dialect Achede, Achede comes from Hete, Hetep in ancient Kemet. And just as in ancient Kemet, you're talking about ritual offering. In Akan, Achede also means offering, gift, donation, and so forth. So first, let's define what Hetep means, Achede means. And then we're going to talk about its implication with regard to self-sacrifice implications for warfare. From one of our publications, an unpublished manuscript that we will be publishing very soon, our prayer on Newt, as we say in that particular text, in the language of Kemet, the term Hetep refers to peace, harmony, yet it is also used as a term for ritual offering. In Afurakani, Afuraikani African culture, it is customary to give ritual offerings to the Nananom Nsamanfo, our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, and to the Abosom, the deities, the goddesses and gods, the spirit forces in creation, the children of the great mother and great father, Nyamewa Nyame. We give offerings to the deities and the ancestral spirits. It must be understood that ritual actions in Apurakani, Apuraikaini culture are never merely symbolic, but are always functional. There is a measurable transfer of energy, an unearthing of consciousness, affected through a feedback system by the ritual giving of offerings. This transfer is akin to the transfer of energy, affected through the consumption of food the chemical response of your organs and organ system. As the nutrients of the food are digested and disseminated are measurable. The chemical response to a holistic diet is a healing and empowering response that is not merely symbolic, but functional. In essence, the act of ritual offering is designed to provoke the necessary units of energy and frames of reference, conscious awareness, necessary to align or realign the spirit of the Apurakani Apurakani individual with his or her ka or kaet, soul or divine consciousness. When such alignment is affected, obstacles to proper functioning can be removed in a holistic fashion. We're going to say that again. When such alignment with our own ka, our kaet, our okra, krawa, our soul, our divine consciousness, when that alignment is affected through ritual offering, obstacles to proper functioning can be removed in a holistic fashion. These may be psychological obstacles, physiological obstacles, meaning health-related obstacles, economic obstacles, political obstacles, spiritual obstacles, as in negative spirit entities, as well as social obstacles, criminal individuals and groups. 
So when we align ourselves with our divine function, encoded within our kra, our krawa, our soul, our the deities that dwells in the head region, every apurakani, apurakani individual, before we enter into a womb, we are an ancestor or an ancestress in the ancestral realm. And before we're drawn into the womb of our mother, we are drawn up to Inyamewa, Inyamewa, Amenet, Amen, the great mother and great father. We are given a divine function to execute in creation. We are cells within the great divine body. And we have a specific function, just like every cell in your body has a specific function to execute within the organ or organ system with, in which it is a component part. And with a cell as the heart serves, cell serves the heart, it serves the whole body at the same time. And the liver cell serves the liver, it serves the whole body at the same time. When it executes the function it was designed to execute in the body, it's supporting the body in total. We are cells within the great divine body of the supreme being. So we are given a function to execute. The supreme being directs a specific divinity, a force in nature a male divinity if you're male, a female divinity if you're female, to take up residence in the head region of your spirit. And that divinity takes up residence in the head region of your spirit. And then you're a spirit with a force in nature in the head region, a spirit with a spiritual brain, so to speak, just like your physical body is a large body and organism, and inside the physical body is a smaller body the organ, which is the brain and the head region, and it regulates all the functions in the body. Your spirit body, when your spirit separates from your body, you are a spirit animating a physical When your spirit separates from your body, you're a sum sum, you're a spirit, but in the head region of your spirit is your spirit's brain. That is your soul, your ka, or kaya, called kra, in krawa, in akan. That is the divinity. That is the deity that the supreme being directed, go dwell with this individual and guide them towards their divine function in creation. Encoded within your spirit's brain is your function. What kind of function are you due to execute in creation? What kind of cell in the great divine body are you to be and how are you to execute that function? That is encoded within your spirit's brain just like your wiring in your physical brain, all the programs and the blueprints for everything that should happen in your body are wired within your physical brain. In your spirit's brain, the same is true. And once you are given that spiritual brain, a divinity dwelling in your head region, now you're a spirit with a soul, and you are sent ultimately into a womb to reincarnate 40 weeks later. And then you come into the world, and as you grow and develop, if you're part of an ancestral culture, your parents and relatives and so forth guide you towards that divine function you came to the world to execute. You're given a name that reflects that function, that resounds that function every time it's spoken, that reverberates the energy that's part and parcel of your spirit so it stimulates you every time you hear it and every time you speak it and every time you think it, that those energetic vibrations that are unique to you realign your spirit with that divine function every time you hear your actual name, which is a group of sound vibrations. And that group of sound vibrations is harmonious, meaning it's in alignment or harmony with your spiritual energy, then you have a real name because it emanates from uh, energy vibrations emanating from your physical vehicle and your spirit body consistently and constantly. That specific configuration of vibration produces your actual name. When you align with that and attune with that, with your spiritual ear and your parents and so forth, they replicate that with the vocal cord and give you, quote, unquote, your name that collection of sound vibrations unique unto you that are constantly emanating from you on a regular basis. So a person has a ka, a kaya, a divine function to execute in creation. The ritual practice through ancestral religion, we ritually incorporate divine law and ritually restore balance. That means we align ourselves with divine order to find out what we need to be doing every moment of every day and when we make mistakes, we realign with our ka, our kayak, to find out directly from our soul, the divinity dwelling in our head region, what we should be doing, what we should be doing, what we should repel, and what we should accept, what things we need to incorporate, what things we need to reject. And then we incorporate that divine guidance into directives for action, and we move forward. We give offerings 
through our feedback mechanism, as we said. When we give offerings of food, give offerings, animal sacrifice and so forth, plant life, mineral life and so forth, the energy emanations coming from these different offerings provoke the energy of the abosom, the forces in nature. And that provocation causes a response to be sent to us. It's no different than speaking. If you speak and send out sound vibrations, they travel through space, stimulate the eardrum of the person, and those ear, the eardrums begin to vibrate, and then there is a response. There's an energetic response. Even if the person doesn't speak back, they have an energetic response to that provocation. Anytime we project energy, we are provoking. It's a provocatory, and when we project energy through the giving of offerings, through food offerings and plant life, animal life, mineral life, and so forth, we are releasing a specific configuration of energy, energy emanation, to provoke the energy of the abosom, to provoke the energy of the nananom and Zimapo, to provoke the energy of our kra, the deity that dwells in the head region, so that once we provoke their energy, they respond to us and give us direction, empower us, and guide us. The forces in nature, the deities, give us guidance. They are the divine powers that animate the sun, moon, stars, black substance of space, oceans, rivers, thunder, lightning, fire, and so forth. And we have those elements within our being. So when we align with the forces in nature, they empower us and replenish our energy, those elements within us that are, the, that are a portion of the elements in creation, they empower us and give us the means by which we can expand and contract that power within us. The Nananum Unsumapo, the spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors, give us guidance on how to utilize that power based on our spiritual makeup, based on our ancestral blood The way one ancestral group utilizes the energy of the forces in nature who differ from the way a different ancestral ethnic group utilizes that energy based on the places they have migrated, based on the kinds of foods they have taken into their system over hundreds or thousands of years, developing certain dietary taboos that other people don't have, living in certain regions and interacting and interfacing with that region of Asaseyafu, the Earth Mother, developing certain social taboos and so forth that another group may not have, developing certain spiritual taboos based on their true history that another group may not have. So these things are specific to clan, to blood circle. So only those who lived as part of that blood circle and were able to navigate life in a harmonious fashion can show you directly how to execute your divine function in the world, to pull in the energy of the forces in nature based on your unique spiritual configuration from that specific plan. Just like you have physical DNA and you can see the shared DNA within a family and everybody looks very similar or a certain ethnic group on the continent, they may all be short or they may all have rounded heads or they may be all very, very tall and very, very slender and so forth, have certain kinds of features, cheekbones and noses and lips that you can identify. This is someone from the Dinka ethnic group. This is someone from the Twa ethnic group. This is someone who is Wolof. This is someone who is Akan. This is someone who is Yoruba and so forth. Just like you have physiological characteristics that are connected to clan and so forth, we also have spiritual characteristics connected to clan based on our interaction and interfacing with creation over thousands of years and reincarnation through specific blood service. So the Nananu and Samanfo give us the guidance on how to utilize the energy of creation, the forces in nature. The forces in nature give us that power and show us how to turn it on and turn it off, expand it and contract it so we can execute our function. They give us the power to execute and the Samanfo, the ancestors, the ancestors give us the guidance on how to utilize that power properly based on clan affiliation. So it is a system. When we get off track, we make offerings. Projection of energy. Provocation of the abosom. Provocation of the nananom and samasa. We give an offering so we can provoke the energy of the forces in nature so they respond to us and inform us. We give offerings to provoke the nananom and samasa so they can respond to us and inform us of what we need to know. We provoke the energy of our own crowd through ritual prayer, through ritual song, through ritual dance, through offering and so forth. All of these are offerings. Not just plant life and mineral life, but ritual song is a projection of energy that is an offering. Ritual dance is a wielding of energy that is an offering. 
ritual, uh, prayer, chant, incantation, various things are various forms of offering. So when we offer, as we say, we want to align with our ka, our kai, so we can align with our divine function through ritual offering to provoke that divinity. When such alignment is affected, we provoke the ka, provoke the kai, the kra, the krawa, learn directly from that divinity. It communicates with us and shows us what we need to know, and we align with that divine message. Once that alignment is affected, obstacles to proper functioning can be removed in a holistic fashion. These may be psychological obstacles, as we said, physiological, health-related, but also social obstacles, criminal individuals and or groups. And we recognize the reality that the whites and their offspring are those criminal individuals and groups, murdering our people on a daily basis, poisoning, torturing our people with chemical and biological warfare, drugs and so forth on a daily basis, genetically modified foods, environmental racism, top dumping toxins in our community, water supplies and, and landfills and so forth on a daily basis around the world, unabated for decades. So we respond in different ways. We're talking about self-sacrifice. We're talking about sacrificial offering, ritual offering. Hetep, meaning peace, meaning bringing an end to something, meaning balance, equilibrium. Why does it mean that? What is the cosmological foundation for offerings being associated with peace? Because peace in English is talking about a specific and a specific result. When you're out of alignment with order, you seek to restore order. You seek to restore balance. You seek that point of equilibrium so you can reestablish balance. The purpose of making offerings is to provoke the energy of the abosom and nananuman samapo so you can receive what you need so that you can realign yourself and restore balance. So that movement towards offering, tetet or tetet, as spoken in the Akan, leads to that equilibrium, leads to that quote-unquote peace, being quote-unquote at rest, meaning being at balance, reaching that point of equilibrium. That is the connection between peace and offering, equilibrium and offering, balance and offering. And you'll see the, the tray, the medut, the hieroglyph, so-called hieroglyph of the medut, the tray with the loaf of bread on top. That is the offering, but it's also connected to the setting of the sun, the returning to that point of balance. At the evening point of the day, when the sun begins to set and crosses the evening point, that's the balancing point. At, akin to this time of the year, around the autumn, or so-called autumn equinox, when the sun is reaching the equinox, or so the equal, equal point, 12 hours of sunlight, 12, 12 hours of darkness. This is harvest time, but it's also seeding time. Harvest time where the sun is, quote-unquote, setting or falling and reaching that balancing point of the year, just like the sun is setting in the evening point the balancing or equal evening point of the day, the end of the warm cycle, the beginning of the cool cycle, the end of the warm part of the year, spring and summer, the beginning of the fall and winter, but it is harvest time. You receive all the things that you work for. When you seeded, germinated, sprouted, fully flowered, and then it was time to harvest the fruits of your labor so that you can be fed and nourished and so forth. Fall fruits falling from the tree, we harvest, we collect them, we get nourished by them, and then we take the seeds and replant at this particular time. So that medu, that hieroglyph, that symbol is recognizing that reality. The plate, the offering table with the food on top of it, offering, but at the same time, the setting of the sun, dealing with harvesting. And that harvesting and retrieving is giving those offerings to feed to nourish, to provoke the energy of the Abbasum so that we can realign with order. But we're talking about here sacrificial self-sacrifice as ritual offering. So we're not just only giving food. 
We don't just only give plant life and animal life and mineral life or ritual song or ritual dance. Some of our people are different kinds of immune system cells within the great divine body. So when cancerous cells invade the body or develop within the body and seek to consume and destroy and murder the other cells in the body, when they engage in police brutality and police murder within the body, these cancerous, disfigured criminal cells, then we have immune system cells that seek out the cancerous cells, isolate them, and kill them. And they come into being to kill these criminal cancerous cells, execute them, and destroy them and expel them from the body in order to maintain the integrity of the organism that happens within our physical bodies, that happens within the body of our community. As Apurakani, Apuraikani people, we are a world black body. The only human beings ever created were Apurakani, Apuraikani people. That was the end of the creation of human beings. We are the only true humanity. Millions of years later, a tiny group of cancerous cells developed within the great black body, just like one out of every 100,000 of your cells will sometimes develop into a cancerous cell. And the immune system cells go and seek and destroy that cell. So when we develop within the black body, there are some disfigured cells within the community, then we isolate those and we remove them if they are beyond repair. In our true story, you have a small percentage of cancerous cells who escaped that destruction and were drawn up into northern Eurasia and separated because of the previous ice age, the last ice age, that simply caused a separation. And then when they began to migrate back into the southern regions of Europe and North Afrika, Afrika, in different regions, these melanin recessive spirits of disorder begin to wage war, begin to proliferate, begin to metastasize, the cancer spreading throughout the black body wherever their, arrest, their development was not arrested. And they have continued wherever they could over the past few thousand years. There's only been over the past 100 to 200 years that they have gained the upper hand after thousands of years of being destroyed militarily by our people. So we are in the situation today where these cancerous cells are consuming our people. But we have immune system cells. And that self-sacrifice as a ritual offering is part of their natural function in creation. So let's look at what are, what are some of the functions of immune system cells. If you look at the function of cell death or programmed cell death, called apoptosis. If you look at the definition of apoptosis, and you can pull this up anywhere on the Internet, we're talking about programmed cell death. It's the process of programmed cell death that may occur in multicellular organisms. Biochemical events lead to characteristic cell changes and death. In contrast to necrosis, which is a form of traumatic cell death that results from acute cellular in injury. Apoptosis is a highly regulated and controlled process that confers advantages during an organism's life cycle. For example, the separation of fingers and toes in the developing human embryo occurs because cells between the digits undergo apoptosis. Unlike necrosis, apoptosis produces cell fragments called apoptotic bodies and phagocytic cells are able to engulf and quickly remove before the contents of the cell can spill out onto surrounding cells and cause damage. Between 50 and 70 billion cells die each day due to apoptosis in the average human adult. So what we're talking about is cells with regard to programmed cell death. 
so they can attack. For example, immune system cells, certain immune system cells will go and attack and destroy cancerous cells. And once they finish their destruction, then they undergo apoptosis. They undergo their own programmed cell death, meaning they return to the ancestral realm. They came into the body. They came into being as immune system cells to kill. That was their divine function. And once they killed the target, then they underwent cell death, a programmed cell death, a divinely ordered, programmed, regulated cell death. Once they kill the enemy, then they take themselves out so that they can return to the ancestral realm. We have individuals in our community who come into being as immune system cells to execute the cancerous cell, the criminal element. And once they execute, then they take themselves out as part of a regulated, programmed cell death. And they return to the ancestral realm. And when you know that's part of your divine function, divine function, your unkra, unkrabia, your divine function, and that is supported by our cosmology and supported by the Nananum Nsamanko and supported by the Abosom and supported by Inyamewa and Inyame the Supreme Being, then you have no fear of death because you communicate with your ancestresses and ancestors, the Nsamanko, on a regular basis. We practice ancestral religion. We pour libation and establish Nkomre ancestral shrines to communicate with our ancestresses and ancestors on a regular basis. So we don't fear what happens after death. We know what happens after death because we enter into their realm ritually on a regular basis, on a periodic, regular basis. For example, in our Khan culture, every sixth Akwesi Da or Sunday is an Akwesi Ada, ancestral observer. Ada means to rest. It's a resting period. We engage in a ritual resting period. We stop all of our regular activities to go into the ritual state and the ritual space to communicate with our nananum insamanko, spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors, to go and communicate with the abosa in that ritual space. And then after we engage that ritual practice, then we get back to our normal everyday lives and incorporate what we learn from them throughout the course of our everyday lives. So we engage the Nsamako. We know what happens after death, so we do not fear death. We look forward to returning to our Nsamanko, our ancestral community in Asaman. So when people have a natural divine function to execute, execution, killing the enemy, the immune system cells, they have no apprehension when we embrace our ancestral culture. When you are an immune system cell and your kra, your krawa, your soul, your divine consciousness, the deity dwelling in your head region motivates you and directs you to and empowers you, execute the enemy, and then engage in apoptosis, program cell death or return to the nananom unsamampo, you move in that divine function. You move in that di divine directive. And no one can stop that. No Achiwadiefo, spirit of disorder, none of the whites and their offspring can stop that. They cannot stop an individual. When the Insamapo and Abo song motivates them on that particular day to get up and massacre the enemy. They can't track it. They can't stop it. They can't control it. They cannot control when the Abo song direct our people to move. They cannot control when the Nananum Nsamampo direct our people to move. And this is the reason why they want us to stay away from Kudu, the Akan tradition in North America, Judu, Juju, the Yoruba tradition in North America, Vodou, the Fon and Ebe tradition in North America, the Gullah Geechee tradition, the Congo tradition, ancestral religion. Because it was through and through ancestral religion 
that we waged war against the whites and our spring. We were empowered and guided to execute them, massacre them, overthrow the slave system. We have no fear when we're guided by our own cry, our own cry, our, our soul, our divine conscience. So let's look at proper definitions of Hetep that often people don't understand. We gave the cosmological foundational definition in the Akan tradition dealing with ritual offering, dealing with the cosmology. Let's look in the language of ancient Kemet and give further definition. And if you look, for example, in a hieroglyphic dictionary, you won't only see the term tentment and so forth, and we showed the connection between that and ritual offerings, but you'll see even more. So, for example, you see Hetep to rest, to be, quote, unquote, happy, content, glad, to do good to someone, repose, to be at rest, or to go on to rest, to set of the sun, to rely upon, to be at peace with. All that is talking about to be at rest, to be at peace, quote, unquote, to be happy, to be, to repose, to reach that point of equilibrium, to manifest balance, coming to the end of one cycle and the beginning of a new cycle, that equilibrium point. How do you get to the equilibrium point? By incorporating law and restoring balance, by accepting order and rejecting disorder, by incorporating those things, objects, deeds, and entities you need to incorporate to harmonize your thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order, and to reject, to repel, to kill, to eliminate those things, objects, deeds, and entities that would otherwise keep you in disorder. And when you exterminate them, then you get back to equilibrium, to balance, to peace, to repose, to be, quote, unquote, happy or content. And this is what Hetep is dealing with. This is why it says peace and joy and satisfaction and many other iterations of that concept, benevolence and so forth, contented in mind and satisfied, or the hearts being satisfied. Hetep abu sinu, the hearts are satisfied. Im hetep, to go out in peace, to go out in balance. That doesn't just mean be quiet and, you know, humble and so forth. It's talking about when you go out in balance, when a warrior or warrioress meets the enemy, and slaughters the enemy and decapitates the enemy. Now they are at peace. Now they are at equilibrium. Now they have brought balance and peace back into their community. So when people look, for example, and they say, well, when the whites in their offspring attack our people, then we get upset. But when black people attack, attack one another, then we don't get upset. And of course, that's not accurate. When our people suffer internally, they're suffering that every day. When a mother has her son killed by another black person, she is suffering on a regular basis, and she is angry, upset, suffering, going through a number of different changes. So is the other family members and friends, and they do what they feel they can do and what they know they can do in order to bring balance to that situation, whether they do what we would normally do and execute the individual or very often in this society, trying to go through the law enforcement apparatus to bring the individual to quote unquote justice. We are suffering on a regular basis and trying to survive and trying to handle that stuff. But it's very similar to if you cut yourself, you suffer pain, and then you go and try to do what you need to do to heal the wound, clear out the infection, protect it from further infection, but you feel the pain. And then you don't put yourself in the position to have that same situation repeat itself. But you experience that pain. On the other hand, if somebody you don't know comes up and cuts you, you still feel the pain and you still seek to heal the wound and clear out the infection and protect it from further infection. But in addition to that, you have rage. You are enraged because some outside individual, not you just accidentally quote-unquote accidents, there's no such thing as accidents in the real sense, but through neglect, you hurt your own self, you still feel pain. But when somebody outside of you, your enemy, comes 
and inflicts pain upon you. You still suffer the pain, but on top of that pain, you feel rage and you seek to execute that individual. And the same is true with our community. We are a black body. And when we are awakened and when we're conscious in the real sense, when we're aware that one pain, source of pain that's inflicted upon us internally, we feel that pain and we seek to correct the damage, to correct the criminality, to correct the disorder. We're suffering from that pain internally and we seek to establish balance and equilibrium. Healing, balance, equilibrium, and the execution of justice if somebody within the community was engaged in disorder. But then when somebody outside of the community comes and inflicts the pain, we feel the pain, but then on top of that, we experience that rage. And that rage is based in the reality that this criminal never should have invaded the body in the first place. When we're conscious and aware, we experience one another as all parts of this great black body, the calm or just like you experience pain if some, you have pain in your finger or, or foot or whatever, that's part of your whole body. The rest of the body is not cut off from that experience. The same is true when we're aware. We're all connected as Apurakani, Apurakani people. So when someone is attacked from the outside in our community, we all feel that pain. We feel the pain of the infliction or the affliction, but we also feel the rage coming from the reality that this outside entity, this virus, this cancer, this bacteria should have never attack the great black body in the first place. So when we talk about equilibrium and balance and re restoration of balance and peace and contentment, that means the eradication of disorder. That is the precursor to that peace that is returned. So when you kill the enemy, that's heta. That's peace. When you execute the enemy, when you bring the enemy to justice, when you exterminate the enemy, that is peace, that is balance, that is equilibrium, that is justice, that is contentment, that is satisfaction. So we give more definition. There are many different variations on that thing of hetsa. And looking at a, at a basic hieroglyphic dictionary, but then you have the hetepu, the hetepu, the people, those who are at rest the quote-unquote blessed dead, the nananom unsamako, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, those who achieve that equilibrium, the nananom unsamako as opposed to just the regular unsamako, the aku, akutu, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, those who learn how to balance their thoughts, intentions, and actions, align them with divine order every moment of every day, once they got to that level of development and manifested that consistently, then they re received the responsibility and the capacity to assist us in our own development by the Supreme Being. The spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors called Aku and Akutu, which means enlightened ones or shining ones, those who are illuminate and so forth, not just because they have a vibrant aura, but they can lead us in the darkness they can lead us out of blindness. So they're also called hetepu or hetepu, those who are at peace, achieved equilibrium and so forth. The beings in the other world to whom offerings are made. The hetepu are also a group of deities in the spirit realm. Hetepu, offering gifts, alms, oblations, endowments, Ritual offering. So this is where we get to the intersection between peace, equilibrium, manifest through the giving of offerings so that you can restore balance, erase deficits spiritually so that you can restore that balance and then you achieve that peace. The nature of that offering is to achieve that hetepu. This is the, the offering in and of itself is a hetepu function, a peace function, a peace quote-unquote offering, that which will eventually end up in Hetep or P. So then there, there are different variations and iterations on that theme. Hetep to you, peace cake, 
offerings, hetep, sepulchral meals, the offerings made to the dead, an offering of flowers or vegetables, a funerary bouquet, the hetep, in soup, the offering which the king in very early times sent to the tomb of a favorite noble, and then of course the king who gives this offering, the Ainsu Hetep, Da and so forth, all these different iterations of that same thing. Then you have the Hetetu N Toto, the Hetetu Divinity, and the offerings made to the divinity, offerings of every kind made to the dead the property of the deities and the temples, the temple estate, the hetepu or offering of the ntoru, ntoru to of the divinity. And of course, we give offerings at our shrines of deities and ancestral spirits, of course, today. There is a deity and more than one deity named Hetep. One of them you find in the per Im Heru, so-called Book of the Dead, Misnomer, the Book of Coming Forth by Day and so forth, the divinity of the Sekhet, Hetep, the divine field, Sekhet, of Hetep, of offering, and his name is Hetep. There's also a divinity, a divinity with a boomerang called Hetep. There's Hetepi, the divinity, the goddess who governs the offering of the deceased. She's a friend of the deceased. Hetepi, the god of offering. And there are other divinities who provide offerings in the spirit realm, and in general, they're called hetep to you, these divinities who give offerings. However, there are more than just that. There are other divinities with the same title, the hetep ntoru, in the fifth hour of the night of the dua. One of the eight divinities who burned the bodies of the damned. This is a warrior divinity burning the bodies of the damned called Hetep. What kind of offering is this divinity giving? That offering of fire to burn the criminal, to destroy and disintegrate the criminal. That is Hetep. That is bringing balance. That is peace. That is equilibrium. Then you have Hetep Sekus, a fire goddess who had the form of the eye of Ra and burned up the souls of the enemies of Osa. Hetep, once again, is part of the name of this kind of offering. What kind of offering is this God is giving the offering of fire to burn up the deceased? Just like immune system cells, the offering they give is that firepower to kill the cancerous cells within the body in order to maintain the integrity of the body. A fire, fire god, a divine killer. Another divinity, Hetep Ta, one of the nine divinities of the bodyguard of Ra. This is what we're talking about. And then, of course, Hetep, once again, is a, can also be the, the place, the shrine place itself can take on that title the place of Hetep for peace or propitiation, the shrine of a divinity, Hetep being the sum soul. Hetep also means with the determinative of the knife to cut to wound. So again, we're talking about to attack, to wage war, to cut or to wound, to carve out. What are we talking about? So when people talk about Hetep, and they just think it means peace and, and serenity and humility and being nice and turning the other cheek it has no basis in reality. Itself is showing you what's taking place. The setting of the sun, bringing balance or equilibrium. The offering of the food as a ritual offering, a sacrificial offering to bring balance where there is a deficit, to eradicate the deficit, to eradicate the purveyors that brought forth the deficit. And when you eradicate the cancerous purveyors who brought forth the, the deficit, then what you have done is you brought equilibrium. You have brought peace. You have brought hetep. That is the offering, the gift. And when people engage in self-sacrifice, those who are immune system cells and self-sacrifice as a ritual offering, they sacrifice themselves 
waging war against the enemy. And then they engaged in the apoptosis, the programmed cell death. Those are some of the most dangerous individuals in the community with regard and from the perspective of the enemy, from the perspective of the cancerous cells, the immune system cells who seek them out and who will kill them and then program their own death and return to the ancestral realm. You cannot stop them. You cannot mark them. You cannot program them out. You cannot track them. You cannot look at a pattern for them. You don't know when they're going to move. They are just going to move. And they are empowered. They are guided. And there is no stopping them. When we look at T cell apoptosis, for example, the regulation of T cell apoptosis. Many articles dealing with this. One particular article, and this is very just across the board, you can find this information in many different places. Proliferative expansion of lymphoid cell is required for effective immune responses against invading microorganisms. So when they talk about proliferative expansion, they proliferate. They're just expanding greatly. Proliferative expansion of lymphoid cells from the lymphatic system is required for effective immune responses against invading organisms. But after the infection is controlled, the expanded effector cells must be eliminated to prevent non-adaptive accumulation of cells. Higher vertebrates have developed extensive networks of signal transduction pathways to ensure controlled activation and expansion of cells during immune responses and apoptotic deletion of lymphoid cells that are no longer needed at the end of the immune response meaning once those lymphoid cells attack and they destroy the invading microorganism, then the deletion of those lymphoid cells through that programmed cell death, that apoptosis, is part of the process so that the body can maintain its balance. Extracellular signals received by cell surface receptors that trigger intra Cellular signaling cascades are essential elements that control both processes. These signal transduction pathways converge to regulate cell fate at both transcriptional and post transcriptional levels. So, what they're talking when they talk about cell fate, they're talking about the fate, of course, of the cell. They regulate the cell fate. These signal transduction pathways converge to regulate cell fate, but they're simply talking about is this is a divine function. This is a program function. It is wired within our being to wage war against invading organisms. The lymphoid cells go after them. They expand. They attack. They, extro- they destroy. And then once they complete their mission, then their mission is done in the body. And then they return to their origin, to their ancestral origin. And those of our people those of you who are immune system cells in the same fashion, those lymphoid cells in the same fashion, coming into being. Some of our people are skeletal cells, and they're structural cells, and they're naturally inclined towards architecture and building and so forth. Some inclined towards healing and bone setting and so forth. And they're healers, and people come to them for bone setting. They come to them for different kinds of healing, while others in that same energy complex governed by the abosome they are structural engineers and so forth. But then you have other individuals who are immune system cells governed by Benna and Abinna as well as Mentu and other divinities waging war against invading microorganisms and cancerous cells. And once they wage war and once they kill and exterminate, then they return to the ancestral realm because their divine function has been fulfilled. That is dangerous with regard to the perspective of these cancerous cells and invading organisms because they cannot be controlled. And this is the power of ancestry list. We have a cosmological foundation for waging war against the enemy. 
self-sacrifice, ritually offering yourself your energy to destroy the enemy in order to preserve the entire body. And when you preserve the entire body, community body, then you can return to the ancestral realm, even when individuals are not conscious of ancestral culture. But internally, unconscious, they have that motivation. They may have been brainwashed and engaged in the life of foolishness and debauchery and so forth, but at some point, they get triggered. So you see the black male Vester Flanagan living a life of debauchery, engaged in white culture and so forth, but at some point, he was triggered. And his trigger pushed him to go and wage war against the whites in offspring. He cut down those two white criminal racist crackers on live television. And after he cut those racist criminal white crackers down, he engaged in that programmed cell death. He took himself out and returned to the ancestral realm. This is what's happening. When such an individual unconsciously, their cra and their usamapo have been guiding them, that they've been engaged in a life of debauchery, embracing white culture and so forth, unconsciously they feel like the one thing they can do to redeem themselves for their redemption is to execute their function at least once and then remove themselves from this realm. And this is what this individual did. You had another brother in Houston, walked up to the cracker cop, the racist white criminal cracker cop who was pumping gas. He walked up to the cop and blew his brains out, put 15 plugs in the cracker's head and executed him on the spot. And these kinds of events will only expand. They will only begin to expand at a greater rate, at an exponential rate, because the cancerous cells in the black body have been waging war against our people incessantly for thousands of years. Of course, they always have an excuse for executing our people, murdering our people. Their excuse is that we deserve it because we are black. But now people are returning to who they are consciously and even unconsciously. And even those who are unconscious, like the brother Ismail Brinsford, who said he was going to put wings on pigs today. And he walked up to the two criminal white cracker cops and blew their brains off. These kinds of events will expand exponentially to the degree that our people continue to awaken and become aware of who they are. The lymphatic cells, the immune system cells, and others will begin to engage in that self-sacrifice as ritual offering consciously, not only unconsciously, but consciously. They will align to the supreme being, the great mother and the great father. They will align to their own crop their soul, their divine consciousness, their krawa, and what is encoded within their divine consciousness, that divine function. And they will be empowered and motivated and guided by the abosom and nananom insamampo execute the enemy. And once they execute the enemy, engage in that self-sacrifice as ritual offering, offering themselves as these apototic cell, offering themselves to destroy the criminal, destroy the cancer, destroy the invading organism, and then they will return themselves to the ancestral realm. You cannot put fear or intimidation in someone who is already programmed to return to the ancestral realm once they complete their mission, and their mission is to kill, to execute. And you can't control their mission because you did not give them their mission. Their mission was given by Inyamewa and Inyame, the supreme being. And you cannot subvert that mission. And they also recognize the reality that when they operate according to their divine nature and their divine function, when it is time for them to go, they will go. 
But if it is not time for them to go, you may seek to hunt them down, to shoot, to kill, and it will not work out for you. When they're in alignment with their divine function, the only way they will be caught up and taken out is when it is time for them to be caught up and taken out. And this is why some individuals, warriors and warrioresses, they prefer a fiery death as opposed to a cool death. They prefer a hot death as opposed to a cool death because that hot death propels them, their energy, and they move forward into the ancestral realm in a fiery fashion. And then they have more influence with that fiery energy to assist our people in the physical world once they've made their transition. So some of them prefer that fiery death to go out guns blazing because it assists them in the after afterworld, in the ancestral world, in the afterlife, and so forth. So this is what we are dealing with, taking place. This is what's unfolding, and this is rooted in our ancestral culture and cosmology. We've already seen it happening with our people unconsciously, even with a brother in Kentucky recently, killing the criminal cops who were chasing him down in the car and so forth. It's already happening with our people Unconsciously, We saw it with Chris Dorner, who went to war against these crackers. He finally reached that point where he decided to listen to his crop. He may not have been listening to his crop for years, but at some point, he listened to his crop. And of course, the white Narrow Spring put out these manifestos and all this other nonsense. Black people don't put out manifestos, so that's garbage. But at some point, he reached that reality. He reached that connection. He connected with his own crop. He was motivated to execute, and he executed. And they set the building that he was in on fire, and he went to the ancestral realm in a blaze of fiery glory. Took some crackers out on the way. It's already happening unconsciously and manifesting on a regular basis and growing exponentially unconsciously. But now it's going to be conscious. People will consciously engage their ancestral culture, Con consciously engage the Nananum Nsamanto, consciously engage the Abosom, consciously engage their own Kra, their own Krawa, and move according to the deity that governs them internally. And such individuals are serious. Such individuals are focused. Such individuals know their mission. Such individuals do not go out and broadcast flamboyantly about all the various things that they're doing and places they're going because they are focused. When you see such individuals, they are not serious. But serious individuals only have one goal. They have tunnel vision, equilibrating sense. They have a mission. They have a function. When it's time for them to move, they will move. And that will expand ex exponentially, exponentially, and rapidly and perpetually. This is the power of our culture. So we're going to go to the phone line, and we're also going to go to the chat room. And if you have a question or a comment on the phone line, it's the number one. If you want to interact in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. And if you go through these messages in the chat room. We just want to make sure we didn't miss any comments. And this one comment saying, on one hand, individuals unaware of all the various meanings of Hetep, and this is why we get that cosmological foundation for the term Hetep. What does it really mean? And it's going back to balance. Not nicety, not smiling in the face of adversity and turning the other cheek, but bringing balance and equilibrium, whether it's through healing, healing the physical body, but also healing the social body, the Afurakani, Afuraikaitni body. And the way you heal that social body internally is dealing with issues internally. The way you deal with it, with invading organisms, you execute and exterminate the invading murderous organisms. That's what Hetep is. And then, of course, you hear this terminology used promoted by the whites in their offspring and spoken by their proxies 
in the community. So they take that sacred term hetep called and, and enunciated as hotep in the Coptic dialect. And the whites and all springs seek to denigrate the term hetep or hotep. Why out of all the words in the language, thousands and thousands of words, is that the word that they seek to denigrate? Why do they call people hotep niggers and hoteppers and all of this other nonsense? Prompted by the whites and their offspring. They wanted to denigrate that term. Why? Because they understood just in general. They can't fully understand because they can't align with the deity whose name is Hetep, the male divinity, or the female divinity, Hetep. They can't align with them. They can't align with the ancestresses and ancestors, the class of the ancestresses and ancestors who are called the Hetep. They cannot align with them. The white snail spring cannot align with the class of Abosom, the deity, who have that title, Hetep, and they are bodyguards of Ra, slaughterers of the enemies of Alsar. They can align with them, but they do have some recognition on the most surface level that Hetep is talking about bringing balance, and that's where the peace portion comes in. They understand that bringing balance is no different than balance when someone is ill. If you get shot, you remove that bullet. If there's a virus, you remove that bullet, that, that virus, so that you can restore balance to your health. If your community is attacked, you remove the viral agents. You exterminate them. And they understood that if we embrace the reality of Hetep and move in that direction of self-sacrifice as ritual offering, giving that ritual offering to the community through self-sacrifice so that you wage war against the enemy, even if it means you're programmed apoptosis in the process returning to the ancestor realm after having made your mark, after having executed your function, they cannot have us embracing those vibrations, those sound vibrations, that powerful set of sound vibrations, hetep or tep on a regular basis, communicating with one another, greeting each other, saying hetep or hotep, projecting that energy, that consciousness of bring equilibrium back into your sphere of awareness and your sphere of influence. Every time you say Hetep, you're projecting the energy that provokes the spirit of the person to restore equilibrium, where there's equilibrium in themselves and therefore they won't succumb to drugs and alcohol and the other traps that the white and offspring set about. Or if they had to come to that, they will be able to overcome it because they're restoring equilibrium, restoring equilibrium to their family, restoring equilibrium to their relationship, rejecting and repelling disorder, including dissexuality, homosexuality, sexual deviance in all of its form, interracial coupling, and so forth. And even if some of our people fell into that nonsense because of trauma, because of a domestic abuse and sexual abuse and so forth as children and adults, when you say contempt and you constantly project that sacred set of sound vibrations, it provokes the spirit of the individual to begin to achieve and seek to achieve that equilibrium, that balance, and therefore begins to provoke them to eradicate white culture. Every time you say Hetep and incorporate it, it's a strike against white culture. It's a strike against white pseudo-supremacy. So this is the one word out of all of the words in ancient Kemet that the whites and offspring sought and seek to denigrate. And the brainwashed Negro mindset embraces that. So when you hear individuals say "potepper," "potep niggers," and all of this other nonsense, you, there are only two kinds of individuals who repeat that: those who are ignorant, idiots, and those who are agents of the white snare offspring. And when you see those agents talking on blog talk shows and Ustream shows and so forth and doing speeches and so forth and talking about hoteppers and hotep niggers. What you're talking about are idiots or agents. Coons, idiots, and agents. That is the black CIA. You have the white CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, 
and then the black CIA, which are their flunkies, are the coons, idiots, and agents. And they all work consciously or unconsciously for the whites and their offspring. So this is what, this is what we're dealing with. And once we understand the reality, Hetep really means the sacredness behind the term, the nature of the divinities who have that title, the nature of the ancestresses and ancestors of that particular class who have that title, and what it means and its implications for warfare, eradicating the enemy and returning to the ancestral realm fully fulfilled because you have executed your function that changes the game and returns that consciousness and restores that consciousness to reality, to balance. And it is the execution, the extermination of the murderers of our people. We're going to take a phone call on the phone line. Michiawo, number 2843. You got a question or a comment? Michiawo. Uh, Brother Quasi, uh, I just wanted to comment on something you had mentioned earlier in reference to uh, the war that we are seeing from the uh, police on black people. Uh, I totally agree with uh, what you're saying. As a matter of fact, at work uh, a couple of days ago, uh, last week, when, whenever one of the last policemen was killed by a black man, a lady looked up and said, I, I don't understand why we're killing policemen. And so I was somewhat dumbfounded at her, and I looked and I said, well, uh, do you think it's because they're killing our people in broad daylight on TV and saying it was an accident? But I think some of us have, is that we have no clue or we have just been simply brainwashed to accept everything that they do because they're wearing a uniform. I mean, when they actually a lot of them are the Ku Klux Klansmen. But we, I, I was just so angry to hear her say that. Now, you spoke also, do you remember the young lady, I, I can't remember if it was Virginia or Florida, where she climbed the pole of North Carolina, I think, and she took down or cut down the uh, Confederate flag? Right. Right. Okay, so that young lady in an interview, uh, I read it in the newspaper, she said the night before that happened she heard voices. And she said that and she just could not go to sleep, but she just heard these voices. She didn't necessarily say what the voices said, uh, but she said she knew she was going to do something that next day in reference to that flag. And so as I was thinking, I'm thinking, yeah, that was, those were your ancestors speaking to you. I mean, I would call her a warrior because she had enough gut to go on the pole and cut the flag down. But if you notice, behind her there came a cracker, uh, you know, right behind her, which I, I was just trying to make some sense of that. But I just wanted to comment on when you were saying that these black people who took their lives, they had a mission and et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to make a comment on that young black lady who uh, cut the flag down, that com Confederate flag down. Yes, and as a matter of fact, um, you know, that person, Bree Newsom, is, is, was already an activist. However, then she embraces the whites and their offspring. So she's speaking right. to, to incorporate all of that. So the reason why she got all of that press, and then we have to question. She says she heard some voices, but we have to question which, who was it? Was it one of her ancestors and ancestors or one of these crackers that she was dealing with? Or if she manufactured that just to make, you know, this appear to be something spirit? Because... But do you do you think no, she, if I'm sorry? Oh no, go ahead. If then, if that be true, it, it, because even if she is, uh, could it be possible that she could be in conflict uh, between the two? Between well, and when it, I. Mm -hmm. Oh no, go ahead. You said when you were saying. <laughs> well, sometimes I think quicker than I can speak or speak quicker than I can think. But I'm just asking, uh, could she be in conflict 
as to whether it was an ancestor or ancestress or a uh one of the what what do you call it the the bad ones the the worst ones uh not a true one uh, right. uh I can't think of the name but could she be in conflict or do you well, think I'm, because the cracker went behind her that that was a, a whole nother agenda behind that well correct that's that is the second piece because they've okay. known of her prior to this, and she ne- she wasn't uh, you know a pro black activist. This is a, a Negro quote unquote activist. So the only people that they give press to, and this was part of that agenda for number one, Obama to go to you know North Carolina and give his little speech, and then all of a sudden, of course, every time he you know goes into a church, all of a sudden his uh, voice changes and he becomes very southern, so he becomes, you know, fricasseed Obama. All of a sudden, he starts singing, you know, yeah, honey like... baked Obama, and <laughs> you know, trying to sound like a, you know, you know, a yeah. Baptist minister, and yeah. everybody jumps up and this criminal stood in front of that church before the bodies of our people, saying, "God used the cracker." to kill these people so that we could all come together and hug crackers and take down a flag. So that was all orchestrated, including her climbing up the pole and then a white cracker coming behind her and everybody focusing on, well, at least it resulted in the flag coming down. Uh It should have resulted in thousands of crackers being executed. But Uh since it resulted in a flag coming down, did everybody focus focused on that like we made some progress as if the United States flag, the stars and stripes are, if any, different than the Confederate flag. All the criminality takes place under the regular flag as it has under the Confederate flag, and every black person knows that. So they're no different. So that was all orchestrated to direct our people and herd our people toward focusing on some quote-unquote victory And then, of course, they get paid their settlement very quickly after everybody embraces and everybody says, I forgive the cracker. Everybody, you know, bows down and says, oh, that was so wonderful that you forgave. We didn't hear the crackers who got, you know, families who who got the the male and female who got gunned down on camera. We didn't hear their families jump up and say that same day, we forgive the brother for gunning the male Mm -hmm. and female down. How come they didn't praise you know, the gunmen say, well, we love you and we forgive you the same day that he executed them. They didn't come out and say that. Everybody's saying he's a monster, a pariah, and everything else. Uh They expect our people to engage in this forgiveness nonsense. So it's all orchestrated to make our people reject what we should be doing, and it's targeted against that small percentage. It's targeted against those who would engage in that self-sacrifice as ritual offering. All of these orchestrated events is to make sure that they can capture as many of those because all it takes is one, one to poison the water supply, one to poison the food supply, one to go into an area and massacre 100 crackers, one to go into an area and drop a bomb and blow up a 1,000 crackers, one to begin to ambush crackers on the expressway as is happening in Arizona. There are so many manifestations of how people can just all of a sudden out of nowhere begin to wage war, and they cannot Uh stop that. So their goal is to have large, you know, orchestrated events affecting the emotions of the people so the people will be herded into a certain mindset so they won't step outside of that and listen to their own cry. Because once we begin to do that, which people are actually doing, then you'll see these criminals being executed on a daily basis, not just one every now and then, but by the hundreds and then the thousands. All right. Well, I am so glad I called in and asked that question in reference to the young lady because that that now that that it it all it is put the puzzle pieces together because you didn't hear anything else about her after that was said and done, and. Uh, Obama did sound funny singing that spiritual hymn that he sung in church that day. The soul was just not there. 
also uh, Madase for that uh, viewpoint and interpretation. Yeah, uh, yeah, and we appreciate the call, appreciate the support, Madase. Okay. Okay, and so we want to make sure we have there's some questions in in the chat room, some comments in the chat room talking about Tariq Nasheed using the term hotel niggas. Of course, that's just one of the many agents sent by the White and House Brain to brainwash our community, mix up a handful of accurate information in the documentaries so that they can push he can push the agenda of the White and House Brain. Of course, the whole Hotep nigger thing, the Hotep bitches thing that he utilizes, a, simply a proxy for the whites and their offspring. And then you hear somebody mention Umar Johnson using the term Hotep nigger, just another brainwashed individual misinforming our people, appealing to the brainwashed mindset of the mainstream of our people. So that's just more ignorance, and we, that is something that we should expect. When people who embrace real culture, you connect with those kinds of individuals, people you know, people in your families, and people who are emerging, connecting with real culture, then you begin to supplant this idiocy and building a network of people who are doing real things, engaged in real, you know, culture, real information, disseminating real information, and building, engaging in the nation-building process. And, of course, when we talk about how I invest you in the seven principal values of nation-building, uh, principles of methods of food production and preservation, methods of curing disease, establishing a military structure, establishing institutions, training institutions for agriculture, training institutions for military structure, training institutions for uh, medicine and so forth, training institutions for government and manufacturing and so forth, institution building, including cultural institutions and spiritual institutions, the establishment of sound systems, governance, and jurisprudence, the manufacturing and engineering and building of, of homes on acquired land here as well as on the continent and in the Caribbean, and developing and manufacturing or clothing, these seven principal values of nation building, they become a natural outgrowth as people embrace culture. Then they begin to coalesce naturally, that natural propensity for us to work in harmony with one another interdependently manifests itself and arises once we embrace our actual identity and begin to execute our divine function. And so we deal with that in our Ojida Mind series, parts one through seven, and the Ojida Mind page on the website, and you can deal with that. You can check that out. But the outgrowth of people re-embracing themselves culturally and spiritually, healing themselves, connecting with their family members, children, and, and spouses, and so forth, connecting with other groups who are engaged in the same process and other individuals, expanding these liberated zones and engaging in uh, nation building, nation restoration, a mind sets you work, that is the outgrowth of embracing culture. Okay, so on the phone line, Michiowo, you had a question or a comment? Oh, yes, yes, I did. Um, I apologize. Last week I had a question about the, um, the negative connotations uh, people have about African ancestral religion, and you know, some people call it uh, uh, black magic, and then they got some called white magic. But unfortunately, I, I, my ear hit the phone and I got I knocked off, uh, and I apologize for that. Um, but that was my question. If you could briefly tell me what that is, and I had another question about the deities, uh, like where are they where are they at now? Um, are they coming back? And um, were they once? Um, Walk the, did he once walk the earth? Okay, so and I'm, I remember when you asked that question and the call dropped, but we but yes, I went sir. ahead and no and, and, for that. Yes, uh, no problem. So and that happens, but we we um I did I completed it. So when, when you listen to the broadcast, of course we we went into some detail. But the black magic and white magic, of course, these are terms um, misappropriated by the whites in their offspring. Uh, what they're talking about, on one hand, they will miss identify our practices just in general. So what we're doing is not magic and everything else. There is a such thing when you're talking about, for example, lower level um, psychic power. When people are just communicating with 
discarnate spirits who are not really, you know, spiritually grounded, as well as mm-hmm. um, affecting the electromagnetic level of person. You know, people, you can, you know, project your energy towards someone in a negative fashion. Um, that would be called in our conference, for example, Abayi Sem, is the affairs of Abayi, or so very often misnomer witchcraft, and sometimes the lower level electromagnetic projection, the lower level psychic activity is thrown in with that terminology. So Bayi, they'll say Bayi Papa and Bayi Boro. Bayi Boro, they will call hot or maleficent, quote unquote, witchcraft engaged in projecting energy beyond the physical senses for negative reasons. And then Bayi Papa, which is the cool or benevolent so-called witchcraft or projections where you're engaged in projecting energy beyond the physical to bring about balance in a certain situation. So wow. those two, you know, expressions, and that's, that's the case across the board. Everybody has their own languages on the continent, so they have different, their own terms for that same concept. But of course, just like you can use your muscular power, people can work out, they can be very, you know, muscular, strong. They can use those muscles to, you know, teach people martial arts or save somebody from a, one of our people from a burning building. Or they can use that muscular power to commit armed robbery. So, you know, you can utilize mm-hmm. muscular energy depending on what's in your mindset. In the same fashion, people have a, a little lower level psychic power they can project beyond the senses. They can utilize that to affect people's thoughts to search through the thoughts of somebody if they've lost their keys or lost some money or something. They can help search their memory and remind them, oh, this is where you were yesterday. And remember when, and they can show them that vision because they can tune into their spirit and remind them you were in this place at this particular time, this is where the money is, this is where your keys are, and so forth. They can use that lower wow. psychic power for something like that to help them. Or they can utilize it to try to project into their mind to give the person some money or give them sex or give them, steal something from them and try to intimidate them or, and so forth. So people operate just like they do physically. They will utilize what they have spiritually on a lower level to operate like that. The opposite well, that forces sense. of nature, the divine spirit forces that govern creation, they don't participate in criminality. So as soon as you fall into that, you cut yourself off from them. You make yourself repulsive to them, just like a magnet reversing its polarity. And now when it gets to the other magnet on the table with the same polarity facing, it gets repelled because it can't get close to it. It can't break that field. Now, and that, that goes to that second question. So yes. The deities are simply the abosom, the orisha, the vodou, the nsoru, nsoru tu. These are the forces in nature. So just like you're, you are a spirit that animates your physical body. And a dog is actually a spirit that animates the physical body of the dog. Or the aloe vera plant is a living entity. It lives and dies as a spirit that animates the plant or a spirit that animates the tree and so forth. The spirit that animates the sun and animates the planet, and animates the earth mother and animates the oceans and animates the atmosphere and the thunder and lightning and fire and so forth. These are the forces in nature. They are both. It's like their okay. physical manifestations are all around us. Of course, we are totally dependent on the earth and the oceans and the rivers and the air and the sun and everything else and the black substance of space, the dark energy and dark matter. The spirits that animate these features of creation, they still animate these features of creation. Just like the same sun that's shown on our ancestors and ancestors is the exact same sun, the sun that's shining on us and we're feeling that heat. The same wow, spirit yeah. that animated the sun thousands of years ago is still animating the sun right now. So when we align ourselves with the spirits that animate creation, then we're aligning with the forces in nature. They will the way they take up residence on earth in the human sphere is when they engage in spirit possession. That happens all over the continent. It even continues to happen here in North America. Whether we're engaged in real ritual or even when some of our people are brainwashed and go up in the churches, then sometimes an ancestral spirit on our both of them will still possess them. If it's a cultivated ancestral spirit, if it possesses them, it will run them out the damn church. And the real deity, it would direct them to come out of that foolishness. It won't remain. The only spirits that continuously possess our people in churches over and over and over again are lower-level, uncultivated ancestors and ancestors and non-relatives. Because the ones who are cultivated mm. will direct them 
Jesus never existed, you need to come out of this proof. But so the way that the major ways that Abosom or Risha Bodu manifest in the human sphere is through possession. When people, you know, get possessed by the Abosom and they speak in the language of the people. Sometimes they call that speaking in tongues in the real sense. When a real ancestral spirit speaks their traditional language, and people won't understand it if we haven't, you know, been speaking our language and so forth. But they possess that way. But then they also manifest as shrines in nature themselves, like somebody who go for libation, they will see the abosom in the water. They can see that spirit. Some people are clairvoyant. Um, some people are clairaudient. They can hear them, but some people are clairvoyant. They can see. Sometimes people are at their shrine doing divination or meditation or giving offerings and so forth. They can see the abosom. They manifest in the form, the quote-unquote human form, a spiritual form, or they manifest um, through their animal totem and send their animal totem, or they manifest through their um, feature in nature. So you see that that rainbow through the rainbow serpent, Ra and Ra'et, Aido Kwedo, you know, um, Da and Aida Kwedo, or Odumare, Oshumare, and so forth. Yonkuton and Yonkuton and Nakan, the creator and creatress, sometimes they will manifest through that, that rainbow entity. Sometimes they will manifest through, you know, their animal totem. Sometimes they will manifest in that male and female form. So they manifest spiritually like that, but they also manifest directly in the human spirit through spirit possession, and that's been occurring consistently. And with our people like Harriet Tubman, Nana Abena Aramita, she would get possessed. After she would come out of possession, she would know which way to escape so the people wouldn't get caught when they were escaping mm-hmm. from the plantation. Okupo Yao, Nat Turner, got possessed to communicate with the spirits of nature, and then he waged war against the white nostrils. So we've continuously been communicating with the forces of nature all along, so they're connected to our blood surface as well. Okay, I got that. That, that makes a lot of sense. Because so normal spirit possession, it, it seems like it's, it's, it's even a negative uh, a view, but really, in reality, I, mean, I guess I guess it depends <laughs> what, what I guess spirit you're really um, connecting with. That's, that's the bottom line, and that makes it, exactly. a difference in it. In it. Okay. Exactly. Great. Great. So, so thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. I've I got one last question. Um, um, whites and their offspring, uh, they, 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 they talk about, you know, heaven and all that stuff, but um, what happens to them? Um, do, do they become spirits, or is there, like, a, a hell for them, or do they just stop existing? Okay, and so, and now we detail some of this. And there's a broadcast we did, Debra Sim, the ramifications of reincarnation. So we okay. dwelled on okay. that in detail. So, but what we no problem. just basically, um, just like we, like when you make your transition, the spirit separates from the body. And of course, go through a funerary process and bodies buried and so forth. There's a time period that an ancestral spirit hangs around the family member that you during the funeral and after the funeral and people see the spirit in the house or see their grandparents, you know, in the bedroom or, or different things. In our con culture, we give about 40 days to the spirit, you know, still interact with the family a lot like that. But then they begin to make their transition. They make that journey to the realm of the ancestors as an ancestor can become seated there in that community. Very similar to the dream state when you have a dream and you're, you know, sitting with your relatives and talking to these relatives at a, at, at a house or something like that, communicating, um, this after-death state is akin to that, and that's proverbial wisdom, divine wisdom teachings in the Akan tradition. If you want to recognize what the Asamando is like, the ancestral realm is like, consider the dream state. So, but they make okay. that, you know, journey to the, you know, where the other Insamampo are. But if the individual was engaged with suffering from depression, anxiety, and anger, and everything else, or some negative stuff, then they still have that strong magnet, magnetic draw to their earthly family. They felt like they shouldn't have died, or they, they're upset because they did things that caused them to, you know, transition like that. And they become earthbound, they become stuck, and they're just hanging around, hanging around the house where they died, and 50 years later, people still see that spirit hanging around the house, hanging around the place where they were murdered on the street, hanging around different places, just like a homeless person, a transient, hanging around places where they used to live or the school, high school they used to go through 40 years ago or whatever, and they're hanging out and they're still depressed and angry 40 years later on the street, harassing people as they walk by. 
such a homeless type spirit is causing problems and projecting ne- negative energy and just curse around, hanging around like that. They can come out of that. You know, we do ancestral ritual and so forth, but at some point, we, we can assist them, show them, listen, you need to come out of that. This is not helping you. Just like a homeless person, it's not helping you just hanging out for years on the street. There are some services out here. You can get connected to some service. In the same fashion, we say to the, you know, depressed, anxious person, just like when they're alive. Some people are just deep in depression. At some point, they have to snap out of that. You have to show them, listen, you're either going to continue like this or you're going to make a change. And at some point, they're tired of operating like that and they want to make a change. When they make that transition, they can be in the same position. We engage in ritual to communicate with them and show them at some point you have to move forward because we're not going to continue to be negatively affected by you and now we're going to cut you off and just repel you. Then they get moved to make some changes, come out of that depression, that anxious state, and start moving toward the ancestral realm to be with the other insomnia so they can heal themselves and continue to develop. But then you have some who are criminal, and we cut them off, and they don't go to the ancestral realm. They're still earthbound, and they can't get to the ancestral realm because they're repelled. And then the earthly family will repel them as well. So they're just like criminals hanging out on the street after hours in midnight, homeless and so forth, but trying to attack people, but they're hanging out because the average person will call the police on them or pull out a gun on them or something like that. So they can't deal with the average people, so they're just hanging around trying to look for vulnerable people, vulnerable people to assault. The whites and their offspring are in that state. They don't have an ancestral round of honored ancestors and ancestors to go to, so they're just earthbound, transient, criminal-type spirits hanging around one another in a criminal-type community and so forth um, until it's until they're drawn back into the womb of one of their descendants. So they go from the physical world to that earthbound criminal state, hanging around other criminal, deceased, homeless spirits, and then they come right back into the womb. We make our transition. We go into the spirit realm. Some of us, if we're, you know, caught up, we'll be earthbound to a certain extent, but the vast majority of us move to the ancestral realm, to the ancestral community, and live there. And then when it's time for us to reincarnate, we go first up to Inyame wa Inyame, receive our soul, divine consciousness, our kra, our krawa, our divine function, assigned to specific abosong, assigned to specific nananong, usumampo, ancestors and ancestors of our blood circle to guide us, and then we're sent back into the ancestral realm to await incarnation into a womb, or reincarnation into a womb, and then we're born back into the world. So that's, that's the process. That's the difference. Wow. What you said makes so much sense. I mean, um, you know, in Christianity, you know, somebody can do wrong all their life, and at the last second in life, you know, repent, and then they're going to heaven. And But what, you, what you're saying, this makes so much sense, and it answers really all the questions, and it's, it's, um, it, it, it's, it makes sense. <laughs> you know, the others that really, you know, other you know, religions, it does, you know, but this answers the question, and it makes sense. And, you know, I appreciate you um, taking time to answer uh, my question. Oh, man, I'll say we appreciate that, and we appreciate the call, appreciate the support. All right, thank you. All right, so. Okay. So, um, so there's a few minutes left in the broadcast. Um, we saw some comments here, and we said that we would make a couple of announcements at the end of the show. So um, what we were saying early on, you know, when people were logging in, is that this, this particular week, tomorrow is the last day of this broadcasting week, but also... Um, Thursday, which is September 17th through September 23rd, is our seven-day Obrajira Nananom Song, our Akwamu New Year observance. So for that seven-day period, we will not be broadcasting because we're going to be having that seven-day observance. So tomorrow is the last day of the broadcasting week. Then we go through September 17th through the 23rd, no broadcast. And then we'll be back on, on Joda Monday, September 28th. September 23rd is the first full day of the Atem Atemet Equinox. That is the first day of our new year, which is 13,016. So, um, and one of the updates, and we're going to send some information out tomorrow, but we plan to have an event on the third day of the new year observance in the D.C., Maryland area, September 19th, Saturday, September 19th. You can come out to this event 
will observe that third day of the of the uh, New Year celebration, the third day of the holiday, and so forth. Of course, it'd be a free event. Um, you can come out, connect with individuals who are, you know, involved in the culture and so forth, and just participate in this Akan observance. Um, and then we're going to be having more observances in the year 1316, of course, which begins September 23rd. We're going to be having more um, events in the D.C., Maryland area on a regular basis, as well as we'll be traveling to the Nanason Beku Ancestral Religion Study Groups in different cities. We were just in Philly this past weekend. We're going to be in Jersey in October and New York in uh, November, but other areas as well. If you establish an ancestral religion study group in Nanason Beku, um, we want to connect with your group. You can establish a study group with one or more people online or in person. When you go to the Feku page, we'll put that link in the chat room. Um, we have a recommended curriculum based on our 16 publications. Um, in order, beginning with the Kuku Tuntum, when you establish an, a Nanason Feku, an ancestral religion study group, of course, that is your own independent group. It's not under our control or administration. That is your own group. We simply have that recommended curriculum. Um, anybody who um, is part of a group or starts a group and so forth, you receive uh, the soft cover versions of our books that you order for automatically for 30% off with you order one or more and so forth, and you'll see that on the FECU page. Um, as we're preparing for the event um, and future events with the event Saturday, if you would like to contribute, this, we're, we're procuring a venue. It took, the reason it's taking so late, we had a couple of venues that we thought we were going to be able to get into, but then there were time constraints and they had some cancellations that didn't go through and so forth, and it kind of pushed us back but we weren't able to get into those venues. So we it appears that we found one, and we'll know for certain tomorrow. Get, we have to get the paperwork and everything else. So it's kind of late in the game, but, you know, some people still know, so we'll be able to connect like that. Um, if you'd like to support the work um, and support, you know, the expenses with regard to the venue and the other things that we'll be doing, um, any donation – to, on the publications page on the website, when you go to the publications page where all the books are, the Homa page, any purchase of any one or more of our books will assist in that process. Any donation, of course, will assist in that process via PayPal. So you'll see that on the page. All 16 books are on the Homa page. All of our 16 books um, range, the soft cover versions, between $8 and $11. Any order of six books, I'm sorry, 10 books or more is automatically uh, 30% off. So, for example, the first 10 books, a 10 book set, 30% off, so it's $66 for 10 books. Uh, the entire 16 book set is um, 105. So, of course, that's less than $10 a book. So, if you'd like to support the work that we are doing, um, any purchase or a donation, of course, will assist in any donation of $15 or more. We will send you one or more of our soft cover books in return for your donation as a thank you for your donation. And this way we can um, cover the um, expenses for the venue and other, you know, the things that we're doing for the observer. So we'll put the link to the uh, broadcast, I'm sorry, the publications page in, on the in the chat room, the Nhoma page on our website, ojidafo.com slash nhoma.html, N-H-O-M-A dot H-T-M-L. And yet I say for those who have contributed and those who are think, considering coming out to the event, um, we will post the information once everything is confirmed by tomorrow morning, most likely morning or early afternoon and so forth. So yet I say for um, you know, your interest in the event, we did get some inquiries, and we're just trying to confirm some things now. All right. So it's only a few minutes left in the broadcast. Just want to go through, uh, make sure we didn't miss anything in the chat room. Okay. So, and get out there posting that information. So it's only a couple of minutes left, so we're going to end here. If you have a question or a comment that was not answered, um, connect with us um, on Facebook, connect with us on Twitter as OG.fo, Instagram as OG.fo, 
YouTube as OJ.fo and subscribe to our page on YouTube as well so you can get any updates that we send out, as well as Google+. Plus. We're OJ.fo on Google+. Plus. Um, also, on this page, the Blog Talk Radio OJ.fo page, um, click the follow button on, on the page, and that way every time we send out the updates of things that are coming up, events that are coming up, then you can automatically receive those updates. Um, you'll be on the mailing list for that. Also, finally, our, we have a social media network that is separate from Facebook that we, is private. We pay for we own. Akuraka, Akuraika, Nanatong, Nhoma, Ntontain, Ancestral Religion, Journal Network, and so forth, and Nanatong, Nanatong, Ntontain, Ancestral Religion Network. It's akuraka akuraikaetning ningcom And we'll put that link in the chat room as well. You can join that network, create a profile. Similar to Facebook, it's just private. And people who are all over this country and around the world are people, of course, only studying this kind of information, sharing, networking. Very often people find that there are people right there in their city or very close to them that they didn't even realize are studying this information. Sometimes we are studying this kind of information. We believe that we're the only ones in the area studying this and incorporating it in our lives, and then it turns out a few blocks down or a few miles down, somebody is on the net, just like you are studying the same information or listening to the shows and broadcasts and so forth, and you can connect with individuals in that way. You can join the network. We post blogs, videos, articles, um, you know, discussions and so forth, and people are interacting on a regular basis. People post the information for their study groups in their different states, and you can find out where people are and ask questions and interact and exchange, you know, information about certain experiences that you're trying to get questions answered about, engage in business networking as well, and so forth. And finally, tomorrow is Egwa Marketplace Day, and we will be posting the information for that uh, tomorrow as well. So, again, Yedase, we thank you for tuning in to the broadcast, and Yedeshia Bio, we will meet again. That's right.